here comes industry 4.0. Computers are now a lot more advanced, um, a lot more memory is cheap, storage is cheap, cloud data, cloud computing is available. Now, with all the advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of the statistical analysis that goes along with that, now I can do something with that data. Just a quick reminder for you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari. Welcome to another episode of the Made in America podcast. Today, I'm with Brian Romano, Director of Technology Development at Arthur G. Russell. Brian, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure, Brian. It's the Made in America podcast. So we start off with the same two questions, my friend. What do you make and why do you make it? Arthur G. Russell is a company that's been around since 1945. Our mainstay today is we build high throughput custom assembly machinery. So anything, if you were to take that- High book, throughput custom assembly machinery? Yes. All right, it's a mouthful. What is it? Um, well, one of the things is you. a lot of people say high speed. We don't do things in high speed. We do things in high throughput. Every time our machine cycles, we make a bunch of something. If you were to take that pan apart, for instance, and put it into its component parts, mm. the, the nib, the spring, and all that, all those components would come to us uh, via feeders and material handling. And then our machine, every time it would cycle, we'd make 4, 10, 20, 48 at a time. Of the pens. Of the pen. So basically, the, to, to say that sort of complex assembly, essentially you're taking multiple parts, you're fastening them into one output Correct. piece, and you're doing a lot of them at the same time, but not necessarily at high speed. Correct. Yeah. Got it. Yep. Um, the one thing that I, I could, do listen. You do listen. <laughs> the one thing that I say we do at high speed because we have to is our inspection of that. Or we have vision systems that look at the parts as they go from station to station. And as they move at 48 at a time from one station to the next, you have to look at them in, in, in high speed. So those things, we have milliseconds inspections. But overall, our machines cycle about 1.7 to 2 seconds. So... I, I, and I, for, for those, uh, the longtime podcast listeners and big time fans may remember uh, that we had Mark Brzezinski on uh, from AGR, I think back in May of 2020. So it's been just about, just about three years. Three so years. great to have uh, yeah. AGR back uh, on the show. Um, tell me, just talk about that a little bit, because I think that technology is, is pretty cool. So you might, we might just make a bunch of one thing in one shot, but then we've got to inspect them really, really quickly. Correct. And all this is built into the machine. It is. It is. So what, what, what size are the machines? Um, they can be anywhere from tabletop, desktop to um, 120 by 80 mini cities <laughs> that are uh, multiple machines. We do integrated production lines. Some of the machines we build, some of the machines we buy and integrate together as a, as a full system. Um, to, to your point, I mean, one of the things that we need to do is uh, inspection. We glue, we fasten, um, we... You name it. We in order whatever it it's takes gotta to come make together that. somehow. Exactly. Yeah. Pressure, twist, nail. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And a as we go along, we um, move it. F sometimes it takes more than one machine to make a complex assembly. So we move it from one machine to the next to complete the next uh, next portion of the assembly. So what kind of products? would typically be made on, a, on an Arthur G. Russell machine? A large part of our customer base uh, is medical device manufacturing. So syringes, catheters. Mm -hmm. um, we had, uh, during COVID, we were um, kind of put into service by our customers to do record setting uh, machines. We normally take six months to a year, depending on the size of the machine, um, to do a machine in six weeks. Whoa. Uh, um, and we did it. We had to take some some paths we normally might have not, um, but between uh, myself and one other individual kind of um, took this machine or machines and got them together in six weeks. But in that case, if you've ever taken a COVID test, and I know everybody has, you get the little plastic uh, modules that have the- The dropper. The dropper, yeah, yeah, yeah. With the little- the control line the, and the COVID line. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we assembled those. Um, really? Yeah. And the little- vial with the filling in it, the reagent fluid, we filled those vials and capped them. So the machine actually works with not just like a discrete component part, but fluids even oh, too. Yeah. So a large, a absolutely. A large part of what we do, um, many of the machines, we either, um, either add a reagent, uh, um, we can add lubricant, we can, you name it. Yeah. We handle fluids on this part of our assembly equipment as well. It's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah. 
lot of technology seems like it goes into that. Yeah. So we have one of the things that we kind of like to say is we don't shoehorn a customer into one platform. We have many assembly platforms we work off of. Um, our big chassis, our big assembly chassis are done on a Swanson chassis. Uh, we have smaller ones that are done on, on smaller servo based chassis. It depends on the speed how many we need to do at a time, it's kind of application dependent. But um, what we do is we pick the, the one that's best suited for the application. Um, and uh, putting everything together in tech, from a technology standpoint, we do what, I, what I'd say from the Swanson side, a robust mechanical cam driven machine that's gonna last 30 years with a, uh, an application of high level technology. We'll put the servos on, we'll put the robots on, we'll put the vision systems on. And so we take what is a known good piece of equipment that's gonna last forever and apply- Some uh, more modern, modern uh, stuff like IoT tech type yeah. stuff to it. Well, it, I wanna get, we've got a lot to cover today, Brian, I asked you to come on because th that, that kind of is a great transition talking about sort of technology and manufacturing. You know, this industry 4.0 thing has been talked about uh, for a long time and what we can do essentially to take sort of my IT world and marry it, uh, you know, with the manufacturing world to, to get to get to a better outcome. And there's a lot that needs to be that needs to be unpacked there. So yeah. so we'll do that. And, and also, um, you know, want to talk about about your history and, and stuff as well. Um, so let's let's do a little bit first. Let's just quickly kind of orient the audience on kind of your journey into industry 4.0, um, your personal your personal journey. Let's just start there and then okay. we'll go from there. Um, I started off um, years ago. Um, I was a junior in high school, started off in the process and automation industry in 1980. That'll kind of set the so, stage. So pre-industry 4.0, let's be uh, yeah, extremely let's, clear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was process and automation controls. My uh, my entire career, 42 years now, has been in process and automation control systems. And that's grown significantly over the time. Um, started my own company after working for another small automation company in um, 1998 and ran that through 2013. And the latter part of that company, we took on a little bit of a spe specialization. There weren't a lot of companies that wanted to go be on the other side of the double doors. A, a lot of IT people that went on, on the other side of the double doors to handle the operational technology. What we did is we were good at the control systems. We were able to take and interface sensors to PLCs, PLCs to computers, uh, computers to servers. Um, and we would talk to IT, but it was kind of, again, that little separation. So like that double doors meaning sort of the separation from the shop office. floor and the office, yeah, right? Sorry, yes. IT folks feeling good about, you know, Excel, we got you. Yeah. Internet, email, we got you. How do I connect like that PLC to the server? Eh, that's somebody else, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's somewhere around 2000, my first customer we did this for was 2004. Somewhere around 2007, I had multiple customers asking me for this. So we were marrying the factory floor to their business system. Already. And so, but you know, actually, let me do something really quickly. I mean, I, I sort of assume some things I shouldn't assume. Let's just do a quick overview of like what it, when people say industry 4.0, what is, what does that mean? So um, let's maybe start from the beginning. Yeah, go ahead. There are nine pillars uh, and uh, I'm going to remember some of them, not all of them, but there's nine distinct pillars of industry 4.0, data analytics, um, autonomous robots, 3D printing, business uh, systems integration, um, the digital twin. Um, and anyway, out of all of those um, things, what it basically does is provide the platform, provide the mechanisms and technology to take the information from the factory floor and integrate it up the value stream to customers and to vendors. So that's the systems integration part that industry 9.4.0 uh, references. And really, I mean, if you look at, I mean, sorry, my view on this, right, is we've been leveraging as humans technology since the beginning of time. And in, in terms of the production of items, right, we, we think of this fourth industrial revolution as sort of going right with the, with the steam, we start with the, start with the steam engine, right? Then yep. we kind of go to some level of uh, assembly line. Mm -hmm. 
then we're talking about some automation, which I think is really what you were talking about back Correct. in the 80s, right? Correct. That's, that That's first, go ahead. In, I'm sorry, Industry no, 3.0. Um, yeah, the Industry 3.0 is exactly what you're saying. It's the application of computers and electronics to the factory floor. Computers being on there to suck up the data, uh, putting it somewhere, hmm. not really doing anything with it other than maybe some rudimentary reporting. Here comes Industry 4.0. Computers are now a lot more advanced. Um, a lot more memory is cheap, storage is cheap, cloud data, cloud computing is available. Now, with all the advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of the statistical analysis that goes along with that, now I can do something with that data. So the transition from industry 3.0 to 4.0, and when I do this in a presentation format, there's a little circle I tie onto the top pillar of industry 4.0. In me, for me, the key differentiator between 3.0 Oh, and 4.0 is the application of the learning that you get from the data in analysis onto the factory floor. I think that's the that's the key. And there's a bit lost there oftentimes because I think some people look at it and say, oh, I'm already using computers on my factory. I'm already in 4.0, but it's really the application of that discrete data for trending analysis to right. be able to make business decisions, right? If you're just collecting a bunch of data and not doing anything, you're not there. Right. So let, let me let me kind of put a business hat on and say, if I apply industry 4.0, where does that show up for me in my business? Like, is it going to give me higher labor efficiency ratio? Is it just more throughput? Is it just capacity planning opportunities? Like from your seat, what does a business see when they in implement 4.0? Well, um, two, two parts to that. The first thing is, yes, efficiencies. I get visibility into my factory floor. Um, it gives me the ability to uh, peer in and see uh, what the data is telling me especially with artificial intelligence AI software. There's two facets that come out of that called predictive and per, um, prescriptive analytics and maintenance. Predictive and prescriptive. So here's the, here's the cool thing about it. So let's say I have a bunch of data coming in and um, I apply this level of artificial intelligence to it. And at one point in that historical information, I get a failure, a motor fails or something like that. Well, there's a whole bunch of data surrounding that. And now in the future, I can kind of leverage that and say, okay, here's all that data. It sort of looks like it did last time this motor failed. All right, based on what I've seen, you've got about two weeks before that motor fails. Go ahead and order the motor, get it here, bring down the line gracefully so you don't have a catastrophic failure causing more havoc. Bring down the line so you can do other PM and things like that and then go ahead and do your maintenance and bring it back online. That one thing alone, that lack of a catastrophic failure, you minimize downtime. I'm not down for two weeks waiting for that motor that it might've had a lead time to it. I bring it in house and do what I need to do on time. That's the predictive, I can predict what's going on and I can prescribe when it's gonna happen. So that dream is great. Is that, can that dream be a reality? Yes. So there needs to be a level of software that goes along with that. You had said well, that's Excel. That's the key. I mean, right. Cause that, I mean, that's, I mean, and, and I, I mean, there's just so much to unpack here, but you know, you throw out this artificial intelligence thing, right? Which with the chat GPT that's come out, like, I mean, everybody's talking about, yeah, exactly. and I don't think people really know what AI really means. And it's probably misnomer too, cause yeah. it isn't really intelligent, but anyway, yeah. separate issue. But so is there out of the box software that can that can do this? Yes. Needs a little configuration, needs a little intelligence of your own on how to make sure the data is doing what it's doing. But yeah, there are several companies out there. Um, one we married with at, at AGR as a systems integrator that we're starting to take the data and look at it. And they, they do uh, dashboards and everything. They do several facets of the AI platform where it does pres uh, prescriptive, predictive, uh, remaining useful life is one of the things that comes out of out of their package. So yeah. So you, so the predictive. So it's interesting because what you had, what you had sort of said was the predictive is not just relying on information you're getting from the machine itself. Because I think a lot of people think, hey, the way I'm going to get my predictive analytics is the machine itself is going to tell me. So I can it'll just tell me on the screen, and I don't need to centralize it. But what you're sort of saying is, that's not really the key. The key is I can look at f multiple data points, almost like a, maybe this is a bad example because people don't like how accurate the weather guys are, but more like how you would think about weather, right? It's not any one thing. It's right. a series of metrics. It's, you know, barometric pressures. It's, you know, exactly. the, you know, the wind gust, whatever, blah, blah, blah. 
and sort of doing that to, to predict. Um, and then the other, and then you said you had predictive and then you had prescriptive. So talk about prescriptive. A little. Pres prescriptive is being able to know that, um, okay, I'm, I predicted my failure and, but I've got buffer time and things like that. I can prescribe how I'm going to do my maintenance. I'm going to say, okay, based on the information I have, I have so much life left. I'm going to go ahead and prescribe the, the following steps. And that I just, and is that, does that knowledge or smarts have to come from the machine itself? It does. I mean, so the machine would have to have some type of already intelligence built into it for this to work? Yeah. So every time I give a presentation about an industry 4.0, there's four points that I always raise. I have this one slide that says you got to expose the data. <clears throat> Talk about that a little bit more. You've got to um, store the data. You've got to analyze the data. And then you've got to apply the learning. Those are the kind of the four major steps. Exposing the data is the big step. Um, it's a little... So I want to go back. So expose, store, analyze, apply. That's right. really the, the four steps. Yes. And exposing of the data, that's what you're going to talk about right now, exactly. which is the hard part. Go ahead. Um, so it's a little bit of a paradigm shift in people's heads. Everybody is keyed on... Um, process data. What's my mm -hmm. temperature of my yeah. mold? What's my plastic temperature? What's my, I know what the process is. Well, now here's the paradigm shift. I've got to expose things that um, indicate the machine health. So do I, I put a vibration sensor on, I put a load cell on, nothing to do with the process data. This is about machine health now. So now we're getting into sort of like the IIoT components. Absolutely. That you need where you're getting, so the data, so people got to realize the data that we're talking about isn't just the process data you're getting from the machine, throughput, uptime, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be external stuff from IIoT sensors we're talking about? Correct. Yeah. So one of the things we started doing is on our machines, we put on, we started putting load cells on our machine. So every time our machine cycles, we know what the the load is, the, the typical load. Is it going up? We put flow sensors on our air. We put power sensors on the machine. Is the machine drawing more power than it should? Um, are we absorbing or uh, accepting more flow than we need? Those kind of things. So you start looking at different aspects of the machine environment, not just the process side. So, so when we're thinking about how to really leverage Industry 4.0, you got to be thinking much broader than just talking to the machines you already have. Absolutely. And it's got to be more than just process capture. If all you're thinking about is measuring throughput and uptime, that's like baby. That's it, baby steps. Exactly. Yep. Don't get me wrong. That stuff is important. You want to know OEE. You want to know how good your machine is doing. You look at bottleneck analysis. You look at uh, what my scrap rates are, yields, things like that. All of that stuff filters in. That data exists today on the factory floor for the most part. Right. So if you're, so for people out there that were thinking that's what industry 4.0 is all about, you're missing the boat. Exactly. Yep. So, so let's kind of, so let me, oh my God, so much. So let's just start with sort of applications. So what are you guys doing at AGR in terms of 4.0? And let's start from the very beginning. Um, how did you guys think about getting started and, and, and moving to use it? Like, well, yeah, use, yeah, business case maybe or whatever. One of the things that I was hired for, um, I've been at AGR for nine years. Um, when I first got hired, my mandate was organize the control systems engineering department and then put together an offering of some sort before Industry 4.0 was a thing, put some package together that we can offer that would give our customers access to their data. So on just on AGR machines? Just on AGR machines. So the idea was, so it's just what's the the business use case here is like our customers want more data on our machines. Yep. Let's help them get it. Exactly. Okay. So over the years, um, our machines take six months to a year. So every time you make a little tweak or addition, it takes some time to figure out if it worked or not. Um, and we did that. We went through time. We organized how we did our programs, how, how our data was exposed, what sensors got added, what software was uh, put on the machine. Um, some customers push back. We actually had a TV. One of the things we did, one of the things I asked my guys to do is we would put a PC on a machine, which was never something that ever occurred. And what I would do is drop a relatively inexpensive and rudimentary, if you will, data acquisition package in. And I started putting on the TVs all of the factors of OEE, you know, what is your yield? What is your uptime? What is your downtime? And customers looked at that and said, get that off there. <sighs> Well, 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 why? And Don't get mad at data. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get mad at data. And they said, well, 
if a boss walks by and sees an OEE below 85%, they're going to question why. And we may have just started up. So our OEE is going to be low. Now we have questions to answer to get that off of there. So we took a step back. So time went on. Uh, that is an interesting uh, anecdote. <clears throat> yeah. Sometimes so, people don't want that sunlight. Exactly. Exactly. Don't expose what might hurt you. That's right. Um, so as time went on, we started uh, adding the sensors, started adding the things. We got to a point where Industry 4.0 was now in the mainstream of, uh, of industry. And we offered an Industry 4.0 package. We had all the data. We had all the software. We had everything to go. Slide it to the customer and say, here, Mr. Customer, here's this bright new machine. Here's the cable. Plug it into your network and you'll have all the data you want. And they go, yeah, cool. Yeah, no, thanks. Really? And it's like, I don't know if they said no, thanks. It may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but it was more like I've got bigger fish to fry. Yeah. Um, and this is where kind of part of what we're talking about. Um, they need help keeping the machines up. So here we are with these new machines with new data and customers are sort of accepting of it, but not doing anything with it. Um, so hold on, hold on, hold sure. on. Sure. So, so you, so the, the first thing sounds like there was a customer need for more data. Yes. Then the customer saying too much data. I don't want to see it. So then where do you go from there? I mean, then you're still pushing it forward. I guess I, I sort of lost the, the plot there. Yeah. It we're we're at a point now where we've done what, what we've been asked. We've, gathered all the data from the machine. We've made it so that the customers have access to that data. Um, we've given them the machine and given them access to the data. Here's industry 4.0. They must know they bought that. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. They just at, at this point have, uh, with other fish to fry, I guess they've kind of, they, they know they have the data. They're just not using it in the full aspect of the way they should. Because if you were to hypothesize, is it because they just have never done it before? And so it's like, I don't know how to do this. And, you know, it's, it's yes. like, it's like I watch people use Excel and, and I'm like, you know, pulling my hair out cause you know, there's formulas for that, but you know, they don't know that. Is that one of those deals? Yeah. I, I think, um, going, going back to some of the marketing expertise and stuff like that, you got the standard bell curve and you got the early adopters and the, um, the laggards, laggards and things yeah, like that. Yeah. Well, I think it was more that had said that there was the chasm, right? We're at the chasm in industry 4.0, in my opinion. Um, the people who have adopted it early on, the, the Stanley Black and Deckers, who've spent a lot of money doing it and investing on it, they're the the innovators, leaders, the yeah. leaders. Um, now we're at a point where software is starting to become more available, less expensive. We're at the chasm now where people are going to start adopting it full out. So Went from pioneers to settlers? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that's right now you put that together with the whole workforce issue going on. Um, they're, they have other things they're trying to do and, um, they, the customer, yeah. um, to that end. So one of the things that we've had to do is we've had to flip how we look at this. All right. We've exposed the data on the machine. We've put a VPN uh, appliances in the machine. Um, we've worked with their IT department to be part of their cybersecurity uh, scheme at their facility. And now we're at a point where we're offering uh, a support program because, all right, if you can't keep your machines up because of that's the other bigger fish fry that we were talking about, they're having issues trying to maintain their machines because of the attrition, the lack of workforce, all of that. Um, They've pushed it back on the on the OEM. Not just us. Our counterparts, our our competitors, are seeing the same thing. The OEMs of the world are being asked to do more, not just provide equipment, be part of the continued maintenance and upkeep of the machine. So we've leveraged Industry 4.0 to look into the machine and offer remote support, look at the data, do that analytics, and and help them. So, so that's actually really interesting. So, I mean, you're, you're talking about, so let's just get to the problem first. So it sounds like one of the challenges the customer is facing staffing shortages. Yes. And you're seeing that sort of across the board, challenges from not being able to recruit plus heavy retirements or what's sort of driving the staffing? Yeah, it's um, the baby boomer, the, the silver tsunami, as we talk about, as you said. Um, but th that and um, so... 
I teach part-time at the University of Hartford. I brought an automation program to UHart Central. I'm on their advisory committee. I'm on UHart's advisory committee trying to get staffing up, get the new generation in. Um, there's a gap between the baby boomers who have learned this stuff from the early days to today. Um, there's not a lot of programs that teach this. It's been, for me even, 40 years ago, it was an acquired thing. I went to school for electronics to begin with, not PLCs, but mm -hmm. so it's acquired. Um, we need to get people into the, the uh, workforce that have this information and have this skill set. And one of the problems is you say industrial, dirty, dank, dangerous. I don't want to do that. It's not something I want to do. And then you say automation. Well, that scares parents away because you're stealing jobs from everybody. Cool. All right. So now what do you do? Somehow we have to get in the schools, the parents and the kids, the students coming in, able to be, to understand that that is not dirty, dark, and dangerous. It's a great career. Uh, it's something that um, is very fulfilling. There's nothing like hitting the button the first time and having the machine do what it's supposed to do after you've designed it all. But getting them into this program, getting them in um, to fill that gap. We've got still, still some baby boomers that are here. Me, I'm on the tail end of that, unfortunately. Um, and you got the the new crew, but there's a gap in the middle that is still kind of uh, empty. Kind of empty. And I got to kind of, I mean, the other challenge I would I sort of see with this is you know, it's, it's not so much like just generally making stuff where the folks that have been around for a long time, they kind of have the feel for the making things and they can really help, you know, even though I know they're retiring, they can help bring up the next generation to impart the knowledge. This isn't really even a knowledge impart game because they've never done this before right. either. Right. So there might be some level of frustration of like, man, I only have a few years left. I don't need to learn this whole new game, like what, I got a big screen. There's like some type of computer telling me stuff like, yeah, where's my bridge port. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then, on the, so on the other hand, you don't have people coming up from behind um, to, to get it done. And that's really the gap that needs to get filled yeah. is like, who's going to be the next generation right. uh, of doing it. And, and you're, I mean, you're teaching at UHart. What do you see? I mean, are you seeing people kind of getting excited about it? No, that's the unfortunate part. Um, we started the program. I, I went back. Oh God, I've been teaching five years. So it was probably that year ish. Um, I went to the Dean at that point, uh, Dean Manzione and the two chairs of the department. And I, I said, look, these are the skills. I had a 45, I had a matrix of 45 distinct skills that my control systems engineers need. And I brought it to them. I looked up their, uh, what they currently taught and said, you need to add this, you need to add this, you need to add this, you need to. And then they said, well, we can modify this class. We can add this class. And we put together that curriculum for automation. Uh, Central has a great one. They've got a robotics and mechatronics program already that does a lot of what we just talked about. Um, but the unfortunate part is going back to, I think it's getting the parents of these kids coming in, getting them used to the word automation and getting them used to what this, what the ability of this profession is from a pay standpoint. It's not an, it's a well-paying profession. Yeah. Um, one of the slides on the uh, recent uh, presentation I did, the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics put out a, um, a fact that said over the coming year, from July of last year through the coming year, there's going to be a 6% growth in automation, which accounts for 146,000 new jobs on top of the shortages we already have. So um, we need to get kids into the programs. And the parents need to understand that, yeah, traditionally, there's the double E. Great. There's the ME. There's the CAMI. -E. What about this whole facet of of engineering, this this control system, automation, mechatronics part of engineering, that needs to come into into the into the world, into students, so that they can hit the. I'm just trying to think where the people who would naturally gravitate to that going to now. And like in other words, are these are some of the people that could be great at mechatronics going into like software development? Is that is that a, is that a sort of you know co contemporary similar? Yeah. Yeah. Skill set. So if you're if you're kind of if you if you dig sort of this software development idea, but instead of just throwing some ones and zeros into like cyberspace and hoping people use it, if you'd want to see 
Because I, I hear what you're saying. You, if you write a program and it does something on the screen, that's one thing. But if you write the program and you hit a button and it does something in real life, that is actually pretty badass. A absolutely. One of the things I, um, one of the classes I, t I taught, um, I had a group full of kids and I said to them, if you go into this field, I can tell you from personal experience, you're going to design it, you're going to help wire it, you're going to program it. And when you hit the button and the machine does exactly what you thought it was supposed to do, there's no better feeling in this world. One of the students in that class I ended up hiring, he works for me at my company, and he ends up being a lab instructor for me too at, my, at, at UART. And I had him in one of the classes and I kind of said that to the next class. And I said, ask him. And he goes, he's right. Uh, right. He's, there's just no, no better feeling in the world. Yeah. And, I, and it's funny, you hear a lot about this idea that it's really the parents that are getting, getting in, getting in the way who don't maybe even know what this is all about. Correct. So from your seat, you know, at UHART as a professor, or someone that I was passionate about this, how do you see change in those hearts and minds? Marketing, I think is important getting in as low as, um, yeah, eighth grade. Of the engineering, engineers not great at marketing. No, so that's no. probably one of our problems. Exactly. We've identified a root cause potentially. <laughs> yeah. Gotta go five whys on that, but I bet you there's something there. I bet you there's something there. Um, one of the things that is out there right now, and even you had mentioned Mark Brzezinski, he's a huge advocate of FIRST Robotics. Um, there's programs like that, um, FIRST and similar programs that let kids early on middle school kids get involved with programming, the interface to a computer, the interface to a servo, vision systems, that's all part of a first robotics platform. I've seen kids in eighth grade pop out programs that was like, wow, that's cool. Yeah, that is cool. What about those like uh, the robot battles? You ever see those like the battle bots? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's like, it seems like a pretty good yep. feeder system. If I was if I was a kid, I think I'd be into battle botting. It yeah. seems, like <laughs> seems like something I'd be, it's you know, something I'd like to do. Yep. So, so when you guys are looking at the value stream of industry 4.0 and what this automation can do from a business perspective, do you look at it as a risk mitigation? Or I don't know if that's the right term, sort of something on the words, but a mitigation against the issues with finding ways to grow your payroll or find staff to fill open roles? Yeah. Um, one of the big things is uh, this is a... Um, our leveraging of Industry 4.0 for this support program that we're talking about is um, a remote program, just that. We uh, enable our machines so you have remote access to the machine. Um, our My engineers are in Bristol for the most part. They don't have to be because as long as they know our equipment, know our standards, know our methodologies, they can do this remote support from anywhere. So there's, there's that. We can um, start to open up where we hire from and everything too. Um, it is, uh, again, being a subscription-based model because what we do is offer block hours um, into the – we give them three different levels to choose from. Silver level, they get 80 hours. Gold level, they get 120 hours. Um, platinum level, they get 200 hours of block remote support. The two upper levels, they get preventative maintenance trips built in. Um, they also get – on the top level, they get the AI software built, uh, as part of it. So you can start looking at the predictive and prescriptive aspects of this. So basically you're saying, hey, what we heard from our customers is love your love this idea, but we can't we can't find enough people to operate what we got, let alone try and get this newfangled thing that we don't fully understand. Correct. So the response back to that is, hey, no problem. You know what's so cool about this? We can actually help you do most of it remotely. So you can get the machine, get what you need, and not have to deal with the staffing. Absolutely true. Yep. Well. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Let's kind of get into the to, to the IT world. So I just want to, I know we're about out of time, but I just wanted to quickly ask, you know, you've got a kind of unique background because you understand sort of IT, you know, and OT and really understanding how those two things are coming together. And I just wonder your view, what does that, what does that look like? You know, how does that come together? How does that come together, continue to happen? And, and what do you see on that front? Um, so part of Industry 4.0 is the you'll see in a lot of the literature, this whole IT, OT convergence. Um, IT, we had talked about earlier, staying typically stay behind the, the doors in the office space. OT is left to their own on the side. And the convergence is being able to take these two disciplines and bring them together. And a lot of people think that they're going to be overlapping and, and completely in harmony. And and this is my opinion, and I may get flack for this, I don't think so. I think they need to align to standard, they need to communicate, and they need to overlap slightly so that there is some interplay. Um, 
and some understanding of what each need, like the cybersecurity part of it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a huge, a, a huge aspect. Um, we've got customers in the medical device arena. And one of the problems with that is I've got all this data. I can't stream it to a cloud. Uh, they won't let me because mm -hmm. it's got to stay on prem. All right. So that means now I need to be able to take and put a repository on site. I need to put a, a RAID array, a server farm, whatever it's going to be. Some to, type of a database back end. Yeah. To be able to store all my local data. All right. So there's part of the ITOT, right? And in order to put that on the network, I've got to understand how that all puts together. I need to take the data from the machines and put it on to those. So you have to understand both aspects how and how they work together. Yeah, it's a, it's a I, I, I tend to agree with you that the we're not looking at like a convergence and a replacement. It's got to be more of a marriage, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's got to be a marriage. It's got to have to be with a lot of communication because they're not the same. They're not the same thing, right? Like a, like a deep understanding of like, you know, TCP IP and like databasing and cybersecurity and, you know, all that, you know, stuff is, is not the same as what you guys need on, the, on the OT, on the OT side. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, it's a very, it's a brave, it's a brave new world, it is. Uh, Brian. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about what you guys have been doing with this. It, it's, in my view, so important that manufacturers that want to be relevant in the future got to start figuring out how to get how to get on board with uh, with what this is because it, it won't be long before if you if you haven't gotten on board, you'll be pretty far behind. Absolutely true. Yep, I agree. Well, listen, man, I'm going to turn us over to a rapid fire round of questions and we'll button it up. Are you ready? I'm ready. Here we go. Red Sox or Yankees? Uh, Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> Starbucks or Duncan? Duncan. Sports car or SUV? Sports car. Staycation or exotic destination? Exotic. Do you have a favorite business book? Um, I don't. Okay. If you had to do something other than be the director of technology development at Arthur G. Russell, and it could be anything in the whole wide world, what would you uh, spend your time doing? Um, I might opt to uh, focus harder on on this stuff as as an entity, just bringing it about f more focused on this. Like just do like an I four consulting business yeah, of some yeah. kind, staying in the staying in the game, staying in the game. Uh, what's something, Brian, that you learned early in your career or early in your life that you think's helped propel you to all the success you've had? Um, kind of, uh, if you, I'm sure a lot of people say this, but it's set a goal. Uh, I forgot the, the, there's like three steps to it. You, you dream about it, you write it down, it becomes a goal, and then actions make it a reality. Everything I've done in my life, from education to my business to uh, my plane to everything, is I dream about it. That's kind of what I want to do. Surround myself with the people that are appropriate to that, whatever it is, and then start acting on it. And you're not going to get anything handed to you in this life. It is a true thing that you need to do. You need to put the labor in. Dude, amen to that, my man. Amen. What's something, Brian, that uh, that uh, you learned um, later in your life, later in your career, that if you go back and tell young Brian, if young Brian would listen to you and make a real positive impact on him? Patience. <laughs> <laughs> It's so weird, right? A lot of people <laughs> say that, but then you wonder if you were patient, would you have got here? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you never know. Uh, man, Brian, it's been awesome uh, talking to you. I really appreciate you nerding out with me on uh, i4.0 and, and sharing your views. It's been a pleasure. Anytime. Same here. Thank you very much. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by Compass MSP. Thanks for listening and spending some time with me today. My goal is to help build a strong manufacturing community, and it would be impossible to do without all of you.